right. Good morning, everybody. Come on, aren't you glad to be at church today? Come on, I'm glad you're here. Hey, happy Veterans Day weekend. Come on, can we give all our veterans a big hand this morning? Come on, thank you for serving. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Week two of a series we've titled Grateful. Grateful. Before we dive in tonight, doors open at 5.30. Come on, men's night. It's going to be awesome. Here's what I need you to bring. You need to bring some friends with you, and you probably need to bring some Tums, uh, some antacids. <laughs> We're going to have a chili cook-off, and there's some folks that going to bring some fire. Like they, gonna, they call it chili. It's actually fire. <laughs> it's going to be awesome. It's going to be a fun night. We've got an incredible communicator coming to share a, a powerful word. I want you to be here. Uh, if you have plans, cancel them. Be here. 5.30 tonight, all right? Uh, worship starts at 6. It's going to be an incredible time together, okay? Uh, go ahead and pull out your notes. If you've got those with you in your worship guide, we say this all the time, but I want to reiterate it. You're going to remember 80% of the things you write down. Okay, that's a true statement. I promise you're going to want to write some things down. I believe God's going to speak to you, challenge you, encourage you uh, this morning. Um, our theme verse, if you've got them in your notes, it says this. It says, to be thankful in all circumstances, for this is the will of God for you who belong to Christ Jesus. Why are we doing a series? Uh, talk about grateful. You know, last month I told uh, our Columbiana campus last week that really this could almost be a continuation uh, from all last month. And when we talked about how do we, how do we live a life on purpose in very dark, difficult, dark seasons of life, there's ways that we can do that. And, then, and so today, this month, really we're talking about this idea of developing a grateful heart and operating our lives in gratefulness. Last week, uh, we talked about the idea of un ungrateful gratefulness. This idea of how I can project gratefulness, but in reality, my life doesn't actually show that. It doesn't portray that. And so last week, I shared with our Columbiana campus, um, you know, when I was nine, eight or nine years old, I, I really, really wanted this uh, specific gift for Christmas. It was a PlayStation. And man, I was, I was pumped about it. Y'all seen a Christmas story, right? I mean, like I had it planned out from January, uh, really December 26th of the previous year to the next. Like I knew what I wanted and I wanted to make it clear and I, was, I could not have communicated it better. Uh, and we get to Christmas day and then like my parents, my family were jokesters. So we, uh, uh, we opened up all of the presents all, all morning long and I was like, oh, I'm nervous, you know, because you know you want that one thing. And then they give me a gift. It's like the last gift that I can see. And y'all, it is like the perfect weight, the perfect dimensions, like, I knew, like, this is it, this is, you know, you get all excited, and I opened up the gift, y'all, it was sweatpants. <laughs> I was so, like, like you know, you, you're supposed to be grateful for every gift. I wasn't grateful. You know, I said thank you, like, it came out of my mouth, but my face said I hate you. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, could not, like, just could not find it in myself, like, to be grateful in that moment. And then my family was like, oh, we're just kidding. And then they gave me the actual PlayStation. But then I was so mad and so upset, I couldn't even be thankful. Like, I couldn't be happy. I was like, you guys are awful. Like, you can't. And I, like, there's a principle in this, okay? Like, once we allow ungratefulness to settle into our hearts, once we allow that root to settle in, it's hard to be grateful. Even when good things start to happen, because we've already allowed the attitude to settle in. And so today, I want to talk to you about an attitude of gratitude. How can I begin to shift my attitude? David said it this way. He said, God, renew in me a right spirit. Renew in me. Change my mind. Change my attitude. The Bible says it in Romans, like, don't be consumed, don't, like, don't be conformed to the, to the ways of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How can I begin to have an attitude of gratitude? C.S. Lewis said it this way, we ought always to give thanks for all fortune. Everybody say all. One, two, three. All. All fortune. If it is good, we need to be thankful because it was good. If it's bad, 
Because it works in us patience and humility and contempt of this world and the hope of an eternal country. So C.S. Lewis says there's always a reason to be thankful either because it was good or because it reminds us that there's something more than this world. Gratitude really can be one of the most difficult things to grab hold of, yet the most life-changing things to grab hold of in this world. So we read a scripture like this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 that says to be thankful in all circumstances because this is the will of God for those that are in Christ Jesus. But y'all, it can be real difficult to be grateful in a lot of circumstances. Would you agree with me? Like sometimes it's just hard. I know I should be grateful, but man, it's hard to be grateful. And like in minute individual little things, like even little things sometimes can get our attitude, right? Like when you just, like when, when they just can't seem to get your order right in the fast food line, like it's really hard to be grateful sometimes. So you know what I mean? Like, I know I should be grateful. I know like, it's just like, how could it be this hard, right? Like it's, it's difficult. Like if you live uh, in Shelby County, like it's really hard to be grateful because like in the last 37 years, it's been road work continually continually. And if you live where I live down 119, thank God they opened the lanes. I was two days away from going to jail. (laughs) Two days. And y'all, I don't have like the, I'm not the best driver. I don't have the best reputation driving. So if I'm frustrated with the whole situation, it is bad. You know what I mean? Like, like I had to check my son out from school the other day. um, And I had to check him out at one o'clock, one a clock, two and a half hours almost before school lets out. Y'all, I had to park my car 30-something yards away from the front door because some of y'all said you needed to get to school at 1 o'clock to pick your kid up at 3 o'clock. I was like, what the heck is going on? Like, why must it be? Like, it's hard to be. Like, we let life get in the way sometimes, don't we? And sometimes, like it just, like sometimes it's insignificant things that change our attitude. Like, like don't, y'all don't get to school, you don't got to get to school at 3 o'clock. You know, if you even get there at 3, it moves pretty quickly, pretty quickly. By 3.05, generally, you're out of there, okay? Like, it's okay to get there a little later. <laughs> it's really hard, it's really hard to be grateful when our kids are living in constant rebellion, Right? Like, how do I fix this? How can I change my attitude? It's really, really hard to be grateful when my marriage is on the rocks and it just might not work out. It's really hard to be grateful when that marriage didn't work out. And I don't know what else to do and where else to go. If I I live in a constant state of anxiety and depression for no reason and I don't understand why, but it's still there and I can't defeat it and I can't overcome it and everybody says you just need to do this and do that and nothing anybody tells me to do works, it's really hard to be grateful. It's really hard to be grateful when the thought of leaving this world sounds better than the thought of staying in it. It's hard to have a grateful heart in those moments. It's hard to have a grateful heart when my career is shot and I'm starting over at an age that I should not be starting over. It's hard to be grateful when everybody in my life seems to be crazy and nothing seems to be going right. There are just things in this life, the list could go on and on, am I right, that make it difficult sometimes to be grateful. But I want to give you some good news. You ready? Gratefulness is a choice. It's not an emotion. It's not based on your circumstance. It exceeds the circumstance. It's why God commanded us to do it. This is the will of God for those that are in Christ Jesus. It is a choice that we make. God commands it, and so it means it's legit that we can operate in it no matter the circumstance. Be thankful, be grateful in all circumstances, for this is the will of God for those that are in Christ Jesus. Why is it the will of God? We know there's been some scientific studies done on people, thousands of people. UCLA did a study, uh, and they, they, uh, they did this study with thousands of people, and they realized, they learned, that the findings that they found were that people that tend to live with a grateful attitude, it lowers their risk of heart disease, it lowers their blood pressure, it relieves stress, it improves their sleep in complete stark contrast to people who consistently live with an ungrateful heart, people who consistently live with what we would consider 
consider a glass half empty life, this pessimistic attitude. Life has just done a good job at beating them down. They literally consistently have physically more unhealthy lives. Life is just harder when you're ungrateful. And so today I want to pray and then we're going to dive in. I'm going to give you three things, three perspectives that I think can begin to change and shift your attitude. And I think not only will it help us spiritually, but I think it'll even help us physically in this life. All right? So let's pray and we'll dive in. Father, thank you for your word, that it's alive and breathing and for us. It inspires us. It corrects us. It shapes us. It molds us. Your word reminds us in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, that it equips us for every good work. And so today, I pray that we walk out of here equipped with the ability the skill, the tools needed to live a grateful life. God, that it'll make all the difference in our spheres of influence and people will be impacted with the gospel through our lives. In Jesus' name, come on, we all said it. Amen. All right, number one, write this down. Um, A perspective shift, an attitude of gratitude. Uh, What do I need to do? An attitude check. Number one, I need to take note. I need to take note. What does that mean? It means I need to live my life with awareness. I need to be aware of what's going on around me. There's this great story in the book of 1 Kings, chapter 18 and 19, about a guy named Elijah, one of the most prolific uh, humans that's ever walked the earth. Uh, Walked so closely with God, this side of heaven, that he didn't even die. Like He transitioned into eternity. The Bible says that God took him up in a whirlwind. Like He just walked into heaven. He was so close with Jesus. He was so close with God. Yet, he walked through severe depression, severe anxiety. He walked through severe doubt that things would actually work out this side of heaven for him. And he got so bad after one of the highest uh, days in his life. The Bible says in uh, 1 Kings 18, you can read that story, uh, he, um, he called fire down from heaven, consumed an entire altar, killed 800 prophets of Baal with his own two bare hands, like the highest of highs in that moment. Like I'm talking, he walked off that mountain by himself with a, a certain walk. You know what I'm saying? Like he accomplished it. Like look at what God did through him. And the very next chapter, we see that he, he literally plummets off of this highest of high off of a cliff into severe, severe depression and anxiety. And and, and in 1 Kings 19, we see that the Bible says he left his servant, he walked away, he isolated himself, got alone in a desert, and the Bible says he went out, laid next to a broom tree, and he said, God, please just take my life. Take my life. The idea of not waking up tomorrow sounds better than what I'm walking through right now. Do it. He somehow, his perspective had completely shifted to himself. And the Bible says that God got him alone in a cave and he began to speak to him. And listen to what he said. God spoke to Elijah and he said, what are you, what are you doing here, Elijah? And then here comes Elijah. I've zealously served the Lord God Almighty. But there are stinking people in Israel who have broke your covenant torn down your altars, killed every one of your prophets. I'm the only one left, and now they want to kill me too. You ever been there? Nobody cares. Nobody nobody knows really what's going on. God speaks to him, and he said, go back the same way you came. Travel to the wilderness of Damascus. Yet, he says in verse 18, I'll preserve 7,000 others in Israel who have never bowed down to Baal or kissed him him. Paul, God, God speaks to Elijah and says, I know from your perspective right now that you think nobody else cares, but I promise you there's lots of people. Take note, be aware, look around. There's more going on than you think. You're not alone. You're not by yourself. It's not just you walking through anxiety. It's not just you walking through a hard marriage. It's not just you walking through something difficult. There are more people in this world going through the same thing that you are going through. Sometimes, it's hard to see the truth through disappointment. You know why? Because disappointment muddies the water. It's just muddy. 
And the, and the hope is that the enemy can make you disappointed enough in this life. What does the Bible say in John chapter 10? The enemy comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. If he can keep you in a state of disappointment in your life, you'll always lose the truth of actually what's going on around you. So here is Elijah in a state of disappointment, so upset, so angry. How could it be this way? Why does it have to be so difficult? He literally lost sight that God had thousands thousands of people that were still there fighting with him. I read about this study that they did a number of years ago, and it says it's been calculated that if you were to reduce the world's population to a city of a thousand inhabitants, 46 of those would be Americans and 954 would represent the rest of the world's population. Those 46 Americans would receive half of the income of the city, and other, the other half would be divided among the remaining 954 people. The 46 Americans would have a life expectancy of 75 years, while the other 954 would live less than 40 years. The Americans would have 15 times as many possessions per person as all of the rest of the people, while the Americans would receive more than their daily food requirements. 800 of those people would not even have what we would call a balanced meal a day. The dogs and cats of the American people would have a better diet than most of the people in the city. Most of the time, my perspective isn't the full reality. The reality is it's just a small sample of what's going on around us. And it's really, really hard to see what's going on when all I can see is the, 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 the circumstance right in front of me. And so God is reminding us to take note, to open our eyes. I'm going to share with you a couple of ways that you can begin to do that very practically. This isn't in your notes. Number one, write this down. First thing I'll tell you, how do I begin to take note is you need to listen to somebody else's story. You need to walk in somebody else's shoes. Hear what's going on in somebody else's life. Listen to what's happening in their circumstances, in their situation. Don't always turn the conversation into your conversation. Don't turn every thought into your thought. Like, listen to what's going on in someone else's life. Second thing I'll share with you that's very practical is you need to serve someone else's need. Serve someone else's need. One of, the greatest, one of the biggest things for me in my life when I'm going through a difficult season, if I can begin to look around and listen to somebody else's stuff and then begin to serve somebody else's need, what can I do to begin to get outside of my own perspective, my own life? I love what God told Elijah. Elijah, get up and go back the way you came. Get up and go serve somebody else. Get up and go find those people that I've told you haven't, even, haven't, haven't kneeled a knee to bail. Get up and get outside of your own circumstance and your own situation. And then number three, write this down. You need to pray for someone else's situation. Pray for someone else's situation. When I am tempted to think only of myself, when I can't get outside, when I'm fixated on my own anxiety, my own depression, my own marriage issues, my own financial problems, when that becomes a real issue in my life, it is an indicator to me that I need to get outside of myself. It is really hard to stay focused on you when your prayer is focused on someone else. It's really hard to keep a perspective that's muddied when I begin to ask God to bless other people in my life. So some of us, we just need to take note, to be aware of what's going on around us. Number two, this one's huge, take, uh, you need to take inventory. Take inventory. I love Psalm 103. It's one of my favorite passages of Scripture. Let all that I am praise the Lord. And may I never forget the good things he does for me. He forgives all of my sins. He heals all of my diseases. He redeems me from death and he crowns me with love and tender mercies. He fills my life with good things. My youth is renewed like the eagles. Isn't that good? That's an incredible passage of scripture. But if you're like me, when you read passages of scripture like this, you tend to focus on the parts that haven't happened for you yet over the things that have happened. So you read passages of Scripture, most likely somebody in this room just now, we read that passage of Scripture, you saw it up on the screen, and we read it in your notes, and you said, oh, yeah, praise all, praise him. Man, I never forget his benefits. He forgave me of my sins. He hadn't healed my disease yet. My marriage is still struggling. Man, I'm still, my, my finances are still on the rocks. And it's easy to forget about the good 
because you're focused on the bad. Except the truth is, these all are promises of God, the realities of his goodness in his timing. In his timing. It's really hard to live a grateful life if I'm not taking inventory of the things he's done in my life. So a very practical thing that I do in my faith journey is I keep a gratitude list. I would encourage you, if you don't have one, you need to have one. Open it up in your phone, keep, the, keep it in the notes section. It needs to be somewhere, somewhere, somewhere close to you. If it's in the journal next to your bed, you need to be able to have access to that gratitude list on a consistent basis. Y'all, everybody, from Steve Harvey to Joel Osteen to Paul to Oprah Winfrey to every other influence in people's life, like over the decades, everybody has said it's probably good that we keep a gratitude list. It's even in Scripture. It's even in the Bible. Be reminded, remind yourself of the goodness of God. And there's a lot of times in my life when I'm walking through a difficult circumstance that I have to be reminded that God is good even when I can't see it right now in this moment. We are so good at fixating and focusing on the negative things in this world. Check this out. Here's some of the negative things that people harp and focus on. This was a, 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 an article in the L.A. Times. Listen to this. They said, this is literally a scientific study. They spent a lot of money determining the potential of this. They said, if everyone keeps stacking these National Geographic magazines in garages and attics instead of throwing them away and letting them decompose, the weight of the magazines will sink the continent 100 feet sometime soon, and we will be inundated by the oceans around us. Somebody's living in constant state of fear over magazines, weighing them down. The number of microscope specimen slides submitted to one St. Louis hospital lab continues to increase at a current rate. And if it continues to do that, that metropolis will be buried under three foot of glass by the year 2024. They're worried about this, y'all. If now, now, I am a little worried about this, okay? Okay. Uh, <laughs> If beachgoers keep returning home as much, with as much sand clinging to them as they do now, 80% of the country's coastline will disappear in 10 years. <laughs> now, I hate sand, and you can't get that stuff off. You know what I mean? Like, I get it, right? We're taking it all with us. You go, oh, that's silly. Okay, some of us that were around uh, pre-2000 pre-Y2K uh, in 1999 because of the end of the Mayan calendar, world experts thought that it was a high potential that the world was going to end when the clock struck midnight. Now, some of you would not admit it today, but you still have bunkers in your home from 1999 because just in case, and even all of us that may have thought it was a little crazy, when it struck midnight, all of us had a little bit of a like, just in case, right? Just in case. Y'all, we worry about crazy things in this world. And if we would make it a habit in our lives to take inventory of the goodness of God in our lives, I promise you it'll begin to shift your attitude. Here's what I've learned, that if we're not careful, we'll spend most of our time focusing on things that affect our attitude in a negative way, in a negative way. And it depletes our gratitude. It depletes our attitude. It turns us into glass half empty, pessimistic people. Some of y'all say you're realist, and when in reality, you just have a bad attitude. An attitude of gratitude. The last thing I'll share with you is number three is we need to take action. Some of us need to take specific action. So number one, I'm, 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 I'm taking note, I'm looking around, I'm, I'm changing my perspective, I'm getting, I'm getting more of a, a, a better attitude, God's renewing that in me, and then some of us need to take this specific action. I love Matthew chapter 3, verses 7 through 9, and uh, uh, John the Baptist is baptizing people, and it says, when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming to watch him be baptized, he denounced them. You brood of snakes, he exclaimed, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? I love this, verse 8. You want to underline this. Prove by the way you live that you've repented of your sins and turned to God. Prove by the way you live. Don't just say to each other, we're safe, we're descendants of Abraham. That means nothing, for I tell you, God create children of Abraham from these very stones. He's saying, prove by the way you live. There ought to be a tangible, noticeable difference between you who follow Jesus and those who don't follow Jesus. 
There ought to be a tangible, noticeable difference between those of us who claim faith in God and those of us in the rest of the world who are living by every wind that blows. Just because life, listen, it rains on the just and the unjust. I know that some of us bought into a lie that when I trust in Jesus, everything will always be up and to the right, that it'll never be bad, it'll always be good, but the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Life happens to all of us, and if we allow ourselves to fix Fixate on the things that haven't happened yet or the things that have happened to me that didn't, that I don't feel like should have happened to me. We are allowing the enemy to win in our lives. You're letting him win. So what's the action? Job 42. Now I want to remind you of the book of Job. Job spent the whole book presenting his case before God. His friends turned on him. They thought nobody could have this many bad things happen to them, and they didn't do something wrong. <laughs> right? Like, Job, you're crazy, man. You did something wrong. Like, like, he presented his case. And the Bible even reminds us that all through the book, Job didn't sin. Yet, listen to what he said. Then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do anything, and you, that no one can stop you. You asked God, who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorance? Is it I? It is I. He said, I was talking about things I knew nothing about. Things far too wonderful for me. You said, listen, and I'll speak. I have some questions for you that you must answer. I had only heard about you before, but now I have seen you with my own eyes. Listen to what he says, verse 6. I take back everything I said, and I sit in dust and ashes and show my repentance. Job said, God, I had no clue. I now see that your ways are higher than my ways. Your thoughts are higher than my thoughts. God, you can see things that I can't see. You perceive things that I have no way of even knowing about. So God, I know today that I know I've had a bad attitude. I know my perspective has been wrong. But Job said, I repent. My action is repentance. He he replied, I take back all the things I knew nothing about. I was talking about stuff I had no clue Next week, we're going to talk. We're going to begin the process of talking about showing gratitude. We're going to talk about how do I begin to show gratitude to God. I'm going to tell you, you can't actually begin to do that until you posture your heart in a way that allows you to begin to do that in, his, in our life. I'm going to read this to you. This is a, 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 do, a proclamation that Abraham Lincoln wrote on April 30th, 1863. As he uh, proclaimed a national day of fasting and prayer, he said this. He said, we have been the recipients of the choicest bounties of heaven. We've been preserved the many years in peace and prosperity. We've grown in numbers and wealth and power. And no other nation has grown. But we've forgotten God. We've forgotten how gracious his hand is, which preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched and strengthened us. We vainly imagined in deceitfulness of our hearts that all of these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own. Intoxicated with unbroken success, we've become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace. Too proud to pray to the God that made us, it behooves us then to humble ourselves before the offended power, to confess our national sins, to pray for clemency and Forgiveness. We've forgotten how to pray to the God that made us. Some of us have been so consumed with what's not going right in our life right now that you've forgotten that there's a God who causes all things to work together for the good of those that love him and are called according to his purpose. You've forgotten that even though you may be walking through something you don't understand today, that God knows more than we know and can do more than we could do. And he is working it out for our good and for his glory. And our perspective, our bad attitude has put us in a place of missing the God looking for the good. The Bible says it this way, and I want to encourage you with this. In the book of Habakkuk, chapter 3, verses 17 through 19, and we're going to pray. I want to put you in some context of this passage of Scripture. The book of Habakkuk is a pretty horrible book. It's pretty detrimental. 
the very beginning of it, he tells, he comes, God speaks through Habakkuk and he says, write down this vision, make it plain so everybody knows what it is. And everybody loves to put that passage of scripture on things, like casting vision and stuff. We love to do that. Here was the vision. I'm about to destroy you. I'm going to take a nation worse than you, whose sins are greater than yours, and because of your disobedience, I'm going to wipe you off the planet. Write that down and make it plain so nobody is confused. That's how he said it. And you get to the end of a back, you get through the back, and here's what the prophet says. God, here's what I know. Even if the fig trees have no blossom, and if there are no grapes on the, on the vines, even though the olive crop fails and the fields lie empty and barren, even though the flocks die in the field and the cattle barns are empty, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes me as sure-footed as the deer, able to tread upon the heights. God, if you never do anything good again, you've secured my eternity this side of heaven. May we be a people who don't consume our lives with what the world calls a vapor. May we be a people who aren't consumed with everything this side of eternity. May we wake up today and shift our perspective and recognize that there is something far greater going on in this world than just what's happening with me. And may we live our life on purpose in a way that honors God for somebody's eternity to be shifted and changed. I want to pray with you. Will you bow your heads and close your eyes? Our band's going to come. They're going to play some music. Nothing funny or weird, I promise. Here's what I want to invite you to do. In this moment, I just want you to pray and say, God, what do I need to do with this word? Don't let it just be a something that you attended today. Let the Holy Spirit work in your heart right now. What do I need to do? Do I need to, do I need to take note? Do I need to get my eyes off of me and begin to see what's going on around me in other people's lives? Maybe I need to take inventory. Maybe I have forgotten the goodness of God in my life because I'm so consumed with my current circumstance. Maybe today, maybe, maybe I need to repent. Maybe I need to take action. Maybe you don't have a relationship with God and you, you need right now to begin a brand new relationship with Jesus. This is a holy moment that you had no clue even showing up today that the Spirit of God was gonna touch your heart and offer you an opportunity to be made right with him. The Bible says that all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. We've all sinned. All of us need a Savior. That's you too. And you would say, Father, forgive me of my sin. I'm so sorry that I've done it in my own strength and my own ability. Jesus, I accept you as my Savior. From this day forward, I'm going to follow you as Lord of my life. Thank you for changing my eternity. And Father, I pray for my family today. God, I pray that we would walk out of this place with a a fresh perspective on the goodness of God. Jesus, help us to know you and the power of your resurrection in our lives. When we don't understand your hand, we're going to trust your plan. When we can't figure out why or how or what, We're just going to trust that if it's God today, it's God tomorrow. Renew in us a right spirit. Holy Spirit, do what only you can do. And, oh, God, you'll get all the honor and all the glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, church. Can you celebrate Jesus today?